Praise the Lord. Turn me down a little bit. Hallelujah. Welcome to Friday night Bible study kingdom conversation. At least I thought it was going to be a kingdom conversation anyway. It's hard to have a conversation with one person. Amen. All right. It's all right. How's everybody doing tonight? We welcome you to the Friday night broadcast from the Ark of Peru. Uh, we like to get together around here and worship the Lord. If you're joining us for the first time, um, Pastor Joshua King and I have uh, uh, great men of God around me that help me out. <laughs> We're going to, if, if you're joining us for the first time, we're, we're having what's called a kingdom conversation where I have a panel discussion after a, a short Bible study. And um, it's a good time. I love this format. And sometimes we come together on Fridays and we just worship the Lord. We have our, uh, a Bible study, a regular service. But tonight is a kingdom conversation. And so uh, we have those who have joined us. Uh, welcome to sit out in the crowd. If you're watching and you're close and you can make it, come on down and see us. If not, keep watching online. Share this broadcast. Share it out. Let Get the word out. If this, if this uh, church and this ministry here blesses your life, share the broadcast. Tell someone about it. Uh, we've been going through a lot of changes. Um, in the last couple of months, um, some some we thought well we're not really prepared for that, uh, but God has kept us. So things happen. Sometimes you expect something, but something else happens. So just give us some time to get organized and uh, just be be patient with us, and we'll get this started here. So uh, welcome me uh, with me to the panel. I, feel like I haven't done this in a while. We try to do these about every third or fourth week, but I haven't, uh, w things have just happened to where we've had to do other things. On my right hand is uh, the executive pastor of this church, David Korn, been here many years. He spoke last Saturday, last Sabbath service. Um, good message, very good message. You need to go back and watch it about being a drink offering. Uh, a life of sacrifice. Like the words of Paul, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings and being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection. We're attaining. That's what we're doing. We want to attain. So that was a good message. Go back and watch it and uh, be blessed. On my left is the assistant pastor of this church, Anthony Tucker. And uh, they're joining me, and they're going to uh, join in this discussion. But first, we're going to have a short Bible study. You can be seated. It's like I threw it on them at the last minute. But I thought they would expect to be up here. <laughs> we're being lighthearted. Looking at... 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. Let me get situated here. I don't want to talk a lot tonight, so I'm going to count on you, all right? All right, good. Okay. First Corinthians, the 12th chapter. 27th verse. Now you are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And God has set some in the church, first apostles, prophets, evangelists, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. But what I want you to pay attention to is this. Paul asks a question of the Corinthian church. Now this was a a highly gifted church. It was a real gifted church. 
they were rich. They lived in a in an area where commerce was was common. Industry, the latest, greatest technology of the day, if it existed, was there. Wealth, a highly gifted church, but they were pretty messed up on <laughs> in some ways. But still, Paul is talking to them in the twelfth chapter, and he says, "Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all evangelists?" He doesn't say this in this particular passage, but uh, later on in in another one of Paul's letters, he says, "God has set in the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, for the work of the ministry." For the edification of the body of Christ. For the equipping of the saints. But Paul wants you to know, not all are prophets. Not all are teachers. Not all have a certain gift of tongues. Not all interpret. Do all have the gifts of healing? Do all speak with you know, diverse tongues. There's a gift of tongues. There's different types of gifts of tongues. But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I'll show unto you a more excellent way. Looking around me, you know, I look at, at the church, I see a variety of people. People from different backgrounds, nationalities, Social economic backgrounds, people with different experiences, but all in the same kingdom of God that I am in. But I look out, and not everyone is a is a pastor. Not everyone is a teacher. Not everyone is an evangelist. Not everyone is a prophet. A lot of call themselves prophets, and there's a lot of apostles too on Facebook. You just gotta look for. It. I mean, just type it in. It's right in front of someone's name. And you have to be careful with that. I think I think people want recognition so much that they get presumptuous and they take to themselves these titles that they have no business doing that. That's a God called office. I would I would beg someone to to stay in their lane if if they wanted to be a pastor of a church. If you're not called to be a pastor, don't be a pastor. <laughs> it's a dangerous place. But not everyone is a pastor, such as myself. Not everyone has the gift, has the ability to teach. And I think I have some ability to teach. Not everyone is an evangelist. Some people just have a talent for it. Not everyone is an apostle or a prophet. Those offices come with great prices, but so does everything else. And I think people so much uh, desire affirmation in a lot of ways that they end up doing things presumptuously and reaching for things they should never reach for. Yes, Paul says, covet earnestly the best gifts. But if God don't want you in a certain area, don't do it. You, you will miserably, uh, most of the time, fail. Because you're just not set up for it. Those are God ordained, God called things. But what I think Paul is showing us in in the twelfth chapter of First Corinthians is encouraging the Corinthian church, who are highly gifted, workers of miracles, interpreters of tongues. Um the best gifts were on display, words of knowledge, words of wisdom, if you continue to read the, read the book of, of Corinthians. Paul says, not all of you are apostles, not all of you are prophets, not all of you are evangelists or pastors, not all of you uh, interpret tongues in, in this way, not all of you uh, can read somebody's mail. 
but you're all important. And the problem we, we find is when you step outside of what you were called to do, you often mess more up than you make things better. So as I, as I sit up here as a pastor of this church, and I see varieties of giftings in this in the people of this congregation. I see talents and abilities. But not everyone is the same. Not everyone has the same calling. Not everyone stands in a in a pulpit, which is a very small part of ministry. Not everyone can stand in a pulpit and deliver the word of God with authority because they are not called to do that. Their pulpit is somewhere else. Not everyone has the gifts of healing. Though you can heal the sick, Jesus gives you the Holy Ghost. He says, you know, go spread the gospel. Yeah, you, the prayer of faith will save the sick. But not everyone has the gift of healing. Where it's a continual, constant, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's the word I'm looking for, it's uh, consistent. Not everyone has words of knowledge, words of wisdom. But you're all important. And then Paul was trying to tell the Corinthian church, you're not all me. You're not all Apollos. You're not Peter. But you are what God made you to be. And so I look out at the church, and I am encouraging the church to find who God called you to be. Invest in that thing. Invest in your faith. If you have the gift of faith, invest in your gift of faith. Let it comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the Word of God. Let your faith grow by investing into it. You'll thank me for it later on. Don't worry that you're not the Apostle Paul, or I'm not the Apostle Paul. I'm not John Wesley or Charles Wesley. I'm not Charles Spurgeon. I'm not A.A. A. Allen. I'm not William Branham. But I have my own gift of God. And if I step outside of my lane, that's where I'll get in trouble. So Paul is pointing this fact out in, this, in the 12th chapter of, of Corinthians, and he mentions various giftings and callings and saying, God put this in you and this in you, and he gave this office to this person, but not everyone is the same, but it's the same spirit. If you want your, and, and it, I, I put a title on this, it's called growing your kingdom life. Growing the kingdom in your life. Before growth happens outside, you have to grow yourself. And part of you growing is nourishing and investing in what God has put in you already. I would never sit here as the pastor of this church unless I had caught the vision God had for my life. And invested into what he had already put in me. I already knew he put in me a desire and a love to teach and to help people. And that plays into my role and my office as the pastor of the church. I already knew God put a love for people. You have to have a shepherd's heart to do this. Or else you'll give up when trouble comes. Uh, a true shepherd will run when the wolf comes, but a, a, an untrue shepherd will run when the wolf comes. A hireling, as the Scripture says, will run when the wolf comes. But a shepherd gives his life for the sheep. I would not be here unless I was placed here. And I would not be here unless I invested into what God planted in me when I was very young. Now, I would not be here unless I would have understood that God was doing something in my life. But I'm not in the office of a prophet. 
Can I operate prophetically? Yes, and I do. When the Spirit allows me to. Can you? Yes, you can. With the Holy Spirit. But just because you, off, you operate in the office of a, in, in the uh, gift, in a prophetic gift, does not make you a prophet. Prophets are called from, from the beginning, from their life. God had set prophets aside, apostles and evangelists and pastors and teachers. That's not something you just, I want to be a prophet. There's a price to pay. But you will never find true growth and you will never find uh, satisfaction unless you invest in what God has already placed in your life personally. He gives us all a measure of His Spirit when He gives us and He fills us with His Spirit. But there are diversities of gifts and callings and talents and abilities that God places in people that He, he expects there to be. And we've talked about this around here, a return on His investment. Bring up, I had it written down, second, give me a second here. Second Peter Chapter 1, verse 5. We're going to go through verse 7. All right. Beside this, this is, this is, base, this is basic stuff. This is every believer. Giving all diligence... You mean I'm to give all diligence just to the basic stuff too? Yes, it's important. Add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. Notice at the very end of this process of adding Diligently to your faith, the virtuous, knowledgeable. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Temperance, you're able to take and handle some things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to. Patience, well, that's a big one. Godliness. You mean all that's making me godly? Yes, invest in it. Let it grow because it's going to serve to bring you into what the other things, the best gifts that you are to covet and desire and, and the, the, all the cool stuff. All the cool stuff like reading the mail of someone. And, and that's, not, that's, that's not even the purpose of that prophetic gift. You're speaking life into someone when you speak prophetically into them. Something God has planted in them. You're speaking life to that seed. It's already there. God's just showing it to you. But all the cool stuff that we uh, are enamored by, you know, calling out someone's sickness, um, their address. It seems to go in, in themes. And God wants really to all of it to function. Miracles, signs, wonders, words of knowledge, words of wisdom, all for His purpose. But all that cool stuff that we... Make huge conferences over, and it's good. It really is. All that cool stuff doesn't come about without this. Giving all diligence, your faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience. Now I'm finally getting to godliness. Godliness, brotherly kindness. You see this? I'm getting smaller. He's getting bigger. I'm being abased, 
He's being exalted. And the end of it's charity. You mean God was trying to perfect charity in me? Yes. All of this flows out of His love. Because if you read, and I lost it, down in, 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 in 1 Corinthians, we were at the end of chapter 12, end of the beginning of 13, Paul says, oh, that's great, but if I don't have love, I don't have anything. You want to grow, your, you want to grow the kingdom in your life? You need to invest in the thing God has called you to do, and you need to pay attention to these small things, the faith, the virtue, the knowledge, the temperance, the patience, the godliness. Brotherly kindness matters. How you treat one another matters. How you talk to one another matters. How you talk to your spouse matters. How you talk to your children matters. How you treat your brothers and sisters, it matters. It matters to God. Because He's perfecting love in you through it. That's where your true growth comes from. It grows out of His love in you. God is love. There's no other, He is love. There's no other definition to it. It's not a thing separate from Him, an emotion. It, he is love. God is love. So if you want all that cool stuff, understand that it comes because of the measure of His love in your life and your revelation and knowledge of the measure of His love in your life that expands your, con- your God consciousness so you can actually understand and see and know what He wants to do, what He wants to say, how He wants to do it, how He wants to say it, because His love has expanded and filled, filled you. He's an ever-increasing force. All of that flows out of His love. So you want to grow? You want to function in prophetic ministry? You want to function in healing ministry? It's here. It's there. It's in you. It's in you. It's in you. Pay attention to these small things. And let love be perfected. You want God's kingdom to expand in your life? You want it to be a a picture of the stone that was cut out of the mountain and smote the image in the book of Daniel and then it became a stone that filled the whole earth and was a kingdom that took over everything. You want that to be a picture of your life? Well, that stone started real small. But it came out of a greater portion. And then it filled the whole earth. It came out of heaven. So all this small stuff, this faith, this virtue, this knowledge, this temperance, this patience, this godliness. Oh, being nice to my brother and my sister and my children and my wife. That's such a terrible thing, isn't it? So hard when they make you mad. But you know what will make you joyful? His love. And when you understand that, you want to be kind. You want to be godly. Let's go in reverse order. You see the need to be godly. You relish in the process of patience that has been created and grown in your life. You joy in the fact that you've been tempered and that you can take some stuff. You rejoice that you have the knowledge of the Holy One. He's made you virtuous and clean and pure, giving you clean hands and a pure heart. And He grew faith in you by His Word. Amen. That's how you grow the kingdom in your life. 
Pay attention to the things that God has put in you, but go through the process step by step, year by year, minute by minute, day by day, and let this stuff grow in you. Let Him increase that faith, cleanse you, give you more knowledge. You want more knowledge? Seek after it. It's all in Him. It's all in Him. All the knowledge you could ever want is in Him. You want to be able to be tempered so you can take some blows and you can take being bent and you can take being hit and buffeted, blown in the wind. You got to go through process. You finally learn patience. Patience. We hate that word. But one place in the scripture says, In your patience you possess your souls. And we all want to be godly. And being godly is being kind to your brothers and sisters. And it's all made possible by His love. End of the story. Amen. Amen. I'm going to bring the panel in. I bet you're surprised I didn't talk that much. <laughs> Who wants to go first? Amen. <laughs> Shabbat Shalom, church. Amen. So glad to be a part of this today. Um, both of these scriptures um, have an interesting parallel. And uh, <laughs> I like, like Brother King here. Um, lost the first one. I know it was in First Corinthians. But... Uh, I notice in both of them, uh, the, the ultimate, here's, here's the deal, Second, uh, Second Peter uh, 1 and 4, you know, I, I, believe, I believe he read some of it or most of it, but whereby are we given unto exceeding great and precious promises. Obviously, the promises of God are, are, are what we're uh, attaining, but... Uh, but the desire here, and, and he says that by these ye might be partakers of his divine nature. Uh, that's the ultimate goal, is to be like Christ. That's the ultimate goal. And, and uh, no, Brother King, it's, it's not necessarily hard. I think that's what the question was, that, you know, to do some of these things. But sometimes it, it gets to a point where, uh, and I know nobody else does this, but I, I see in myself that there's more that needs to be changed than what I think I can change. <laughs> like like we, we, we read last week about, you know, Paul saying, well, I haven't attained. He went through his whole life saying, I haven't arrived. I'm not there yet. I still need prayer. You know, the, the, the struggle that I have in me, you know, is is, uh, you know, between my members, and, you know, we read all this about Paul, then, then he gets down to this one scripture that says, you know, I'm ready to be offered up. Well, I, I kind of, I, I, I look at him, and I see myself. It's like, oh, I haven't made it yet. There, you know, there's struggle, and, and the divine nature, uh, how many of us know that the battle is right here between our ears? Right, right, right. In, our mind is the battle, you know, and, and, and we, we, we read it and, and we remember it. Many of us can quote it verbatim. Uh, not too many scriptures I can quote verbatim, but the principles I know very well. But, uh, but he says, don't be conformed to the things of this world. It's in Romans. Uh, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That there is where it happens. That's the struggle. That's, that's where you're going to have it. And, and, uh, and the fact of the matter is, that's where you're going to win the battle. Uh, and and the, uh, both of these scriptures that, that we read, and, and I'm in Second Peter here, uh, 
they all understand that there is a uh, there is a place that we have to strive for in our minds. Uh, you know, uh, the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, through your worldly desires and my worldly desires, the things that we struggle with. You know, uh, all of them are not, you know, uh, things that are immoral and ungodly. There are a lot of things that we struggle with, attitudes and spirits and, and, uh, and, and things. There, uh, you know, and I, I, tell, I, I tell many people all the time, and I don't, I don't know how a lot of you, you feel about it, but I, I'm, an, I'm a sportsman, I'm a hunter, and, and uh, I've done that all of my life. But there was a time that I laid that down for about three years and did not do anything because I felt drawn to the things of God, and I felt like those things were my passion, you know. Um, you know, brother, <laughs> brother Anthony knows. You know, we 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 get along together about, uh, along those lines, and 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 there's things in me that I feel like I just I'm absolutely passionate about, and I literally found myself uh, doing something. It wasn't immoral. It wasn't ungodly, but it was against my level of sportsmanship and that day I went home and the Lord convicted me and for three years I did not walk in the woods I did not I I laid it down uh, and I'm just simply saying that that there's all of us there's places sometimes where God is drawing us and uh, and every one of these places began Right here in the mind, your decision, what is the sacrifice? What am I willing to lay down? What am I, how far am I willing to go? Because every one of us, regardless of your age, regardless of, uh, of what, you, uh, how, what you do in the church, your, your role in the church, your role in the, in the work of God, every one of us has and will come to a place where you will have to draw the line in the sand and say, okay, I need to take a different look at what I'm doing. Is, am I doing, am I literally doing and accomplishing that which the Lord would have done, the divine nature? And that is our goal. That is literally our goal. And besides the, the giving of all diligence and, and to your faith, virtue, the faith is what you believe in. Virtue is basically how you handle every situation. Your, your integrity, who you are when you are alone. Think about it. And, and then faith, virtue, and virtue, knowledge. Now that I've gotten my attitude correct, I need to start picking up the Word of God. I need to start gleaning. I need to be in church more. I need to be in more activities around the church. Ask, reading, asking, uh, asking questions. Those things, many of those things, the, can I say, the common Christian don't really do. What is it that you're doing on a daily basis that encourages growth? in the level that God can use in a different level. And, uh, and then he says, uh, knowledge, you know, from virtue, knowledge, and then knowledge, temperance, oh my goodness. Now temperance is talking about the challenges. It's talking about the literal struggles. When you have somebody that rubs you the wrong way or, or you, things go, that don't go your, your way or, uh, you know, all of the struggles that you can see in a week or in a month or even in a year some pretty hard times and 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 he says he says knowledge temperance and then from temperance is patience now patience is you know we understand that tribulation works patience and i would say if you're not going through some type of struggles and tribulation i'm talking I'm talking right out, hell coming against you, tribulation, then I would be afraid. I would be concerned. Um, and this is much of what 
<laughs> what prompted me in the spirit to, to minister what I ministered to last week is the fact that, oh, my God, am I really maturing? Or is it just status quo? I'm just going to wait till the Lord comes and hopefully I can get a little uh, cabin you know, on, over in the corner of glory land. That is the mentality of many people living for God today. And that's totally beyond and below what he has placed in each and every one of us to do and become. Temperance, patience, and patience, godliness, being like Christ. Holiness is not what you wear. Holiness is not really how you look. That will affect the way you look. But holiness is being God-like. Is being what God is. And, uh, though, and being holy will then create in you a desire uh, to do godly things and to look godly. And then godliness, brotherly kindness. And then last, charity. Kind, brotherly kindness is, is how you treat your brother. But kindness, yo, know, love, love is how you treat your enemy. Love is how you treat that individual that did you wrong. That's where the rubber meets the road. Hey Amen. Uh, I don't have a lot to say, but I'm going to go back to the beginning where you were talking, you know, being careful about claiming an office. You know, really, when I got into the church in about 2013, I started noticing that offices became fads. The fivefold ministry really is a fad in the church today. It's not, no one's okay with being behind the scenes anymore. They've got to be in the spotlight. And when I came into the church, it was all about the evangelist. It was all, if you were an evangelist, you were on top. Everyone else, you never heard of them. You know, there's, I can't look back in 2013 and ever hear about a time we invited a teacher to step up and you know, get that sermon going. It was all about getting that guest evangelist, getting that guest evangelist. And it really, I, I was doing some research on my phone before it died. Um, <laughs> there were, in 1960, about 650 million people claiming, one, excuse me, one in four of those 60, 650 million claimed to be in that uh, fivefold ministry, some type of office in that fivefold ministry. That's a lot of people claiming to be in some office. And when you, and now today, moving on, I mean, you don't really hear about the evangelism evangelist anymore. You know what you hear about? The prophet. It's all about the prophet now. Everyone, everyone went from wanting to be an evangelist to now it's wanting to be a prophet. And, and you know, you've got to be careful when you treat the fivefold ministry as a fad, you're just following what everyone else is doing. Because a lot of times, if you're not called to do that, if you're not called to be in that office, you're going to hurt yourself. And you're going to hurt other people as well. And you're going to fail miserably. Uh, to give you an example, the seven sons of Sceva. Miserably. They had no authority. They were not given authority. They were not given a mantle to do what Paul was doing. They didn't, ha they didn't have the office of Paul. Yet they tried to do what Paul was doing because what he was doing was cool and in, in kind of putting it in today's terms. It was what he was doing. They saw the power. They saw what he had in that office and they tried it. And what happened? They were overcome by it. They were overcome by the spirits. And we, it, it's, you really have to be careful on even a desire for an office. I mean, when when I first got in the church, if you even thought you were called to the ministry, buddy, you had a mop in your hand and a toilet brush scrubbing the toilets. I think uh, that was everybody who's ever been. I remember when Pastor Reed, he came up to me and says, hey, I feel like you're called. 
I said, what does that mean? He goes, that toilet brush. It's still in my hand, too. Yeah, and I'm the pastor yeah. of the church, and I still clean toilets and mop I doors. had to understand before anything, yeah. before a position, before anything, it was all about being behind the scenes and doing service. It was about scrubbing those toilets when no one else wanted to. It was about cleaning things up. It was showing up to every church work day. Um, yeah. That's what it required. Because when you're truly called, this is an easy, easy way to tell if you're called. If you're called, it was like what you were saying. You felt a drawing that made you put everything else up to do everything else for the kingdom. When you're called, there's more. There's always more you've got to do. There's, when you're sitting, you can't just stay there because you know there's more that God wants you to do. I've been in places where I, I don't feel like I'm doing enough. It's just in that mindset of when you're called, there's more to do. And so if you really want to know if you're called, how much are you willing to do? How much is that desire to want to do more? Because the it's like what you said, the, and it's the, the term, the you know, the, the common Christian, the normal Christian, they, they want to do the bare minimum. That's not called. That's just scraping by the deep calls and then the deep the the farther you go the deeper it gets is kind of what we were talking about earlier the farther you go out the deeper it gets and the more it is required to yeah. stay afloat in a sense but that's really all i got just just really pray when you feel like you've been called and really the the name it, my goodness i had this discussion with uh pastor reed uh usually if you have to put apostle prophet in front of your name, you're probably not that. <laughs> you're probably not. So, yep. Oh, that's, that's all it's, I got. It's a fad. It is. And we're not discouraging. You, has, you said you had something to say. Okay. Let me finish this thought. We are not discouraging um, people uh, being what God called them to be. In fact... We, we encourage those things. Everyone has a gift of God in, in his church, that it all works together. And uh, this came back to my attention. And again, this is that other passage in Ephesians, the, the fourth chapter and the 11th verse. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. He gave these offices are a gift, not to yourself, to the church. You want to be a pastor? Learn to be broken. To be rejected and to see the hurt and the pain in other people and how you handle even the naughtiest sheep. I went through brokenness that I don't even know where it came from. <laughs> I don't even know, did I ask for it, Lord? But he allowed me to be broken. And because of that, I can feel the brokenness in other people and see where their lives need to be healed, which is what a shepherd does. But he gave these gifts to the church. Some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of their ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith. So with these fivefold ministries is given so we can all come into the unity of the faith. What is the unity? And the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, and the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Everything works together to make the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ manifest. And what happens if it doesn't? That we be henceforth no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. By the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lay in wait, they lie in wait to deceive. 
but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. If we don't have the fivefold ministry, if we don't have the perfecting of the saints, the edifying of the body of, the Christ, of, of Christ, if we don't have these things and come into the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the, of the stature, the fullness of, of God, we're tossed the church becomes subject to be tossed to and fro and carried about. Everything matters. So we encourage interpretation of tongues and uh, the gifts of working of miracles and faith. It all works together. If you're not an apostle, that's okay. Because you're part of what's keeping us from being tossed to and fro. The lighter a, an object gets, the more it can be, the wind can blow it. The heavier it is, the harder it is for the wind to blow it. A full body is harder to move unless it moves itself than a leg. So when the leg is missing something else, the body can be affected. All of it works together to bring about the full manifestation of the man Christ Jesus in the church. So we are not tossed to and fro. So you are you are important. The apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher are important. So is the worker of miracles. So is the gift of faith, hospitality, word of wisdom, word of knowledge. So stay in your lane and be what God called you to be. Pay attention to those small things because that's how you're going to grow into these things. And I might I add this, everybody wants to be a prophet, and the prophetic ministry is what God is, God's voice is speaking right now. But what is the purpose of a, of a prophet? Malachi tells us that the, Elijah will come, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children, and the children to the fathers. You want to be a true prophet? Turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the children back to their fathers so the church can be unified again. Mending God's family. It's not just speaking, you're going to receive $500,000 and you're an evangelist and you're that. That's That happens. But the prophet also says some hard things and is often rejected. Sawn asunder, Isaiah. Isaiah, you wrote a beautiful poetic book, and it changed, my goodness, it changed the eunuch in the book of Acts life because he was preached Jesus from the scroll of Isaiah. But Isaiah was sold in half by a wicked king. You don't hear about that so much. Amen. Turning the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. Bringing order back in God's family. That's what a prophet does. Healing the sheep, helping the sheep. That's what a pastor does. Evangelists peril their lives for the gospel. To take it to the furthest reaches. To be martyred many times. Anyway, go ahead, brother. I'm going to quit talking now. <laughs> How do I follow that? <laughs> I don't know. There's so many you do a good aspects job. of what we're talking about here um, to be anticlimactical and go back a little bit. I just um, The thought came to me just as an example. Um, uh, somebody, you know, uh, well, the fact of the matter is God calls people that are busy. Um, this is just kind of something that uh, that I know and understand in the work of God and how you how you works. But uh, more than likely, if you're kind of a little um, you're kind of sitting at home most of the time, not doing much and not not doing around the house or not 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 staying busy, you know, more than likely, <laughs> he's not going to call you to do something else in a limelight position. Uh, and this is just kind of something to think about in your mind that, you know, 
God normally calls people that are busy. Um, and I, I can go through a, a, a conglomerate of different places in Scripture, but, but just, just to keep it simple, um, you know, I was speaking with someone today that was helping me uh, clean the church. And, and uh, of course, I, I was here with four hours sleep and, and just really, really feeling sick and tired and uh, not wanting to be here. And, uh, and they began to tell me about all the things that they've already done <laughs> before, before 1030 today. And it's, it's like I looked at them and I said, I'm, I'm feeling tired just, just listening to you talk. You know, but <laughs> the fact of the matter is, uh, you know, and, and this just comes down where the rubber meets the road. That, you know, 10% of the, of the congregation normally does 90% of the work. Yeah. True. In any congregation, that's just it's just what it is. Unfor it's unfortunate that it's that way, uh, and that's just kind of a statistic. It doesn't have to be, uh, but I would challenge you to try to be the ten percent. Try to be part of that ten percent because that I think I think Brother uh, uh, Tucker, you know, talked about the, the, you know just just being there when the when church work is going on and being there when cleaning is going on and and uh the things that, that you know be there uh when you're supposed to be there on the time that you're supposed to be there and do what you're supposed to do that is the type of individual that god ends up normally calling and using in in those things that we're talking about here today and uh, i just kind of that that come to my mind uh, and the fact that, you know, a lot of people want to sit around and wait until God calls them to do um, a certain ministry or a certain work. And it doesn't happen that way. You look at the people that are busy, and those are the people that, that God normally uses. And it's normally, you know, very busy, you know, doing this and that. And, and then you learn that, okay, this is my thing. I need to set that aside for the work of God. And you will end up sacrificing things that you want to do for the work of God. But that's the way it works. He calls those. And then he, he doesn't call the people who have it all together and those who can sing and have it. He calls people who are available. And then he equips them. Yes, he does. Amen. Amen. It's been a good discussion. If you want more, come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. and come see us. You want to grow the kingdom in your life? Start with your faith. Start with the little things, and, and that's what we're doing. You're, you're an extension of the kingdom of God. The ark approves an extension of the kingdom of God. What operates here... Uh, may not operate the same all the time as it does in, you know, let's use Morningstar for an example, or, or Mobile, Alabama. But it all works together so that the church is not swayed, and we can stay in sound doctrine, and we can, we can be a functioning, living, growing body of Christ that's going to fill the whole earth. So invest in what God has invested in you. Pay attention to the things He's uh, put into you that you have. Believe for more. And understand there's a price to be paid. It's a price. But it's worth it. It surely is worth it when you find your purpose. When you're in the perfect will of God... Things can be falling apart, but your faith is so big, and it will keep you. It will keep you. And you'll go through that season, and you'll come into the next, and God will bless you. But you got to be in His perfect will, and don't neglect the gift that is in you. All right, come back and see us uh, tomorrow at 11 a.m., and thank you for joining us online. We bless you. We love you. And uh, 
have a good night. Shalom.